Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to the Saturday edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. On the show today, we have invited the sisters from the Western Cape. Uh, that is the authoress, Jasmine Khan and Najmunisa Solomon, to come in and talk about the marriage gap. How do we fill it? They were on the show on Wednesday and they absolutely delighted us with their knowledge, their insight and all of the empowerment stuff that they do in the Western Cape. So we've re-invited them on the show today to talk further to us about these very dynamic concepts about the community, about family relationships, family matters, and of course, more importantly, marriage matters. But first up, let's get our bodies into shape by choosing the right exercise regime for ourselves. Um, if you're a couch potato, then please do stay watching this part of the interview because I think you're going to change your mind right after hearing anything and everything you've ever wanted to know about Pilates. My guest is Zaida Ismail. She's been practicing her craft for many, many years. And when you do see her on your screen in a minute or two, you'll see that she's the picture of a perfect health. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam. Jazakallah so much for having me here. Yeah. Lovely to have you here. And you truly are the picture of perfect health. <laughs> Jazakallah How so long much. have you been involved with Pilates? So I've been doing Pilates for maybe about 20 years. Ooh. Yeah, just about 20 years, but I've been actually teaching and instructing classes for the last eight years. But you're a qualified accountant, correct me? Yes, yes. So we had a career change, I think like most of us. Um, we start off on one path and we kind of land up, I, I suppose, where you, where you need to be. So, okay. Yeah. When we talk Pilates or any form of exercise, going to the gym, walking, running, whatever it might be, by merely mentioning it just exhausts me already. So where do you find the stamina to be going at it for that many years? You know, I think because I know the benefit of it. Okay. Because I know how it improves your body, how it improves your mind. That's why I think a lot of the women that started off, yes, it is difficult. It's difficult to start off something. But when you see the benefit that it brings to you, that's how that road just gets longer and you end up just committing to it. You could have chosen any form of exercise to start up and um, build it into a very mm -hmm. thriving business. I mean, back in the day, 20 odd years ago, all forms of gymming were, was kind of the in thing. And it seems that the different types of exercise regimes also go through a phase of being in trend, so to speak. But you've been at Pilates for a long, long time. Do you see any changes? Do you think people would tire from this form of exercise? You know, I know when I started Pilates, I was maybe like one of the odd person that knew about it. The very few people. Yes, very few knew what Pilates was. And it became, it's literally become an in thing now recently. So um, I think for me, it was more something that I, I got drawn to. I'm one of those 80s kids that grew up with Jane Fonda, so we would put on those leotards <laughs> and our leg warmers, and that would be our, my, my ritual. Every single morning, that's what I would do. Put on my Jane Fonda video and follow it through. And when I look at Pilates, it's more in tune with that form of exercise. So less jumping, less evasive on your joints, more control. It's like you get to know your body, actually get to know your muscles and how they work and how they're supposed to function. Typically, how long does a Pilates session last for? So it's about an hour. An hour, my classes generally last for one hour, 10 minutes. I always add that extra stretch in. I know people are, we have this misconception that Pilates is stretching and nothing like stretching. It has to do with pure control in your body, pure strength. Okay, you have your own studio in Lanasia, am I correct? Yes. And it's been running for quite some time. Yes. Um, what is it that you believe draws the women to you and, you know, you have the staying power? And I think your studio is called Pure Pilates. Yes, it is. You know, it's an environment where everyone's welcome. We all started off at ground zero. And when you come to my classes, there's no compulsion to do what the other ladies do. I've got people who have been training 
with me from day one. So that's maybe eight or nine years down the line. Sure. They've been in my classes. But being a first timer, you are welcomed into that class. You work at your level and you build yourself up. And there's no, um, no compulsion to like do what the other ladies do. Why would people do Pilates? And I'm thinking most of us uh, go on some form of exercise regime, be, you know, maybe go to do spinning classes. I know it was big a little while mm -hmm. ago. I don't know if it still is as big or running or walking or canoeing or whatever it is, hiking, um, etc. Why would you encourage people to invest in Pilates? What are the benefits as opposed to other regimes? So Pilates was developed about a hundred years ago. So it was developed by a man called Joseph Pilates who used this form, this technique to rehabilitate soldiers in, wow. in the war. Um, and then he took this over to America and his studio was based across the ballet studio. So every time anyone would get an injury in ballet, they would pop over to the Pilates studio, get themselves fixed up. And this was a time before physiotherapy, before big gyms. So for me, Pilates actually works in tune with your body, exactly like how your body is supposed to function. That's how we work. We work within the joints. We work within tiny muscles that exist that help your big muscles. And also the main purpose of Pilates is to increase your core strength. So the core being the midsection of your torso, which is so important for us. I don't think people realize how important your core is. It stabilizes and it holds your upper body upright. So if you don't have a strong core, basically your shoulders are going to overwork. Your hips will overwork. And that's where all the problems come in. You'll get hip replacements, knee replacements, ankle injuries, shoulders. So it's centered around your, around your core getting your core to be nice and tight so that your upper body is nice and supported. If your upper body is supported, the rest of you will function properly. Absolutely. I always take that um, the analogy of a, a jar. If you fill a jar and you fill it up and it'll be really heavy and then you place it on your hand. So what's going to feel it down here? It would be your hand. Your hand would be totally heavy. Or if you hold it by the lid, then this hand would be sore. That's the same thing. That's your shoulders and your joints. But if your abs are nice and strong, it houses your internal organs. There are so many benefits of having a, a strong core. First of all, it supports the trunk. Then it allows movement in your upper body. Thirdly, it also, um, it also creates an internal pressure, abdominal pressure to hold your organs in place. Oh. So it's really important. And then we've got your spine. One of the most important structures in your body is your spine. Your nerve endings round, run down your spine. If your spine's not strong, if your spine's not healthy, you're going to have problems within the rest of your body. That's where your nerve receptors are down. So people find, especially when doing Pilates, they find spine lengthening. If you've got a bit of a curve in your spine, your spine straightens up, so you have a healthy body. I've been told that people who do Pilates seem to appear to be taller. And I've noticed yes. you as you walked into the studio and I thought, wow, she's tall. Is that true? <laughs> you know, I think, I know. But I always, over time you're going to possibly add you know, one or two centimeters you know, you to do. your height. You actually do. I do um, a height measurement at the beginning of the year and towards the end of the year, I do another height measurement. And it's not that you grew taller, it's just that you straightened up oh, wow. and your spine has straightened up and maybe the the little spaces between your spine which are so important for us to have that actually lengthens so just on that point that is the difference between pilates and any other form of exercise no other exercise targets that spine okay let's go for our first ad break Saida Ismail is my guest. She is a Pilates instructor. Instructor. She owns her own studio in Lanasia. It's called Pure Pilates. And we'll be talking some more about the benefits of Pilates right after the ad break. Our first interview for the morning is with uh, an instructor from Lanasia, her name is Zaida Ismail. She runs a studio called Pure Pilates, and she's here to talk about the health benefits of this exercise form. Why would I choose Pilates as opposed to, there's a myriad of other exercises I could choose. 
why Pilates? What's so special or unique about this exercise form? You know, I always say a good indication for us is how we perform our Salah. Performing your Salah five times a day, having to stand through long lakats, having to come down, having to go into a proper sejda, especially for us Hanafis, we've got to be flat down to the ground. All of those movements can only be created and can only be performed effectively if your body is in its optimal level. And um, that's why Pilates is amazing. So aside from the muscular strength that it does give each part of your body, meaning if I tell you, pick your leg up, you will be mindful that I'm going to use my quadricep, my glutes are going to activate, my abs are going to stabilize, and my hip flex is going to draw my knee to my, to my chest. So it works with the anatomy of the body. And also why Pilates is so effective, aside from the core control that I spoke about, and your individual muscles is your mental awareness. The instructions are so precise, and you need so much of control within the class that you need to be mentally aware exactly for an hour. Now, with our busy lives, we just kind of go through the motions. So mental awareness is something that we kind of, we hear, but we're not actually here. But Your mind the, wanders yes, all over the place. Everywhere. But in a Pilates class, you have to be so focused and You've so controlled. Con it's like a brain gym. Okay. That's why one of the benefits of Pilates, aside from better sleep, um, muscular structure, is your mental ability. So to reduce... Um, to reduce you maybe having Alzheimer's, dementia, wow. any mental illness. And I guess being in the class itself, whilst you're concentrating, mm -hmm. you're so intent on your concentration levels that any stress that you might have had, yes. anxiety, just kind of dissipates. I know I've had ladies who started off the first class and thought, oh, that's not so bad. It's easy. Second class, not so bad. By the third or fourth class, oh my God, this is so difficult. This is so hard. I've had my experienced ladies who are with me for eight years who have shook in class, like they actually shake at the amount of control that they have. But to reach that level takes a lot of time, a lot of practice and, you know, not giving up. And that's the one thing I find, especially within our communities, you are going to feel pain, especially if you haven't exercised for a while. So you will feel it. But you know what? Push through the pain and you'll have a healthier, happier life. So no pain, no gain. No pain, no Now, gain. like other exercises, I think one of the main reasons why a lot of people do attend gym or Pilates or any other exercise class is to lose weight. That's um, top on your list. Mm -hmm. And then to be in, um, obviously, a, a peak fitness condition. Does Pilates give you that if you stick with it? And in terms of time frames, you are guaranteed if you do spinning for a month, you lose X amount of kilos and you'll be in top form. What does Pilates say about uh, promises like that? So, you know, I, I, I always say I'd like to change the mindset of people. So it's not about how much weight I'm going to lose and how thin I'm going but to be. But you can lose weight on Pilates. You know, it definitely does tone you. It tones you. But like any exercise routine, it has to work with nutrition. Of course. So if you don't have a healthy diet, you're not going to lose weight, no matter how much time you spend on that spinning bike. So a good balanced diet incorporated with any exercise. And I always say Pilates added to any routine, whether it be, whether you be a runner, whether you be a cyclist, a swimmer, add Pilates to that routine will effect, will make you effectively be better at the sport that you are in. So um, currently the South African rugby team does Pilates. Wow. David Beckham is an advocate for Pilates. So it's not, only, it's not only designed for women, which is a pure misconception because men, it was designed by a man for everybody. So adding Pilates to any form of exercise that you are currently doing, even if you are a rock climber, add Pilates, it balances out your body. It creates a strong base to effectively do anything else. I've been told, uh, and you mentioned it just now about a physio, physiotherapy. I've yes. also been told that it strengthens the muscles. So if you have weak muscles in any area of your body, you can go to a physio and then complement it by going to a couple of, or join Pilates on a more permanent basis. Is that going to work? Definitely. So I am, as a, Pilates is a branch of physiotherapy. So a lot of my exercises that I do, I exercise is given by a physiotherapist to a person. Wow. So if you have 
just say an issue with your shoulder, you will go into a physiotherapist, you will go to a physiotherapist and they will fix up the problem. But maintenance, you can't just uh, eye a maintenance. So right. a Pilates instructor is maintaining what the physiotherapist has fixed up. So a lot of my clients are referred to by a physiotherapist. At what age would you recommend people? So I'm thinking children. I'm thinking mothers who come to Pilates mm -hmm. class and have kids that don't want to leave the kids alone at home. Um, is it safe for children to start Pilates most, and at what age? Yes, most definitely. Most definitely. It has very little impact on your joints. I've had moms who have brought their nine-year-olds and eight-year-olds just for fun to my classes. They've enjoyed it. It teaches them control. It teaches them how to take their mind and connect it to their body, which is something that I think all of us need to do. This mindless movement that we do within our daily routine, we just mundane into the same thing. It teaches you to connect to your body. And the breathing, the Pilates breathing is so beneficial. It centers your mind, it allows you to take your breaths in and not get shadow breaths. So we generally, most of us breathe very like halfway through our lungs. It will teach you to breathe through your diaphragm, which is your deep breaths. And obviously it gives you that um, sense of calmness. Okay. You talk sense of calmness, you talk about deep breathing, you talk about dissipation of anxiety, etc. Mm. It kind of almost sounds similar to yoga. What are the similarities or the differences? So the main difference would be whereas Pilates concentrates purely on core strength, core strength as well as spinal alignment. And yoga is more, I mean, if you look at pure yoga, it's more centered around your spiritual being. Ah. So meditation, mm -hmm. and it's a branch, I think, of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. So that's where yoga stems from, whereas Pilates is pure rehabilitation and physical strength. I have ladies who are 73 years old, in wow. my class, mm -hmm. who can hold plank for two minutes and a proper plank that takes a lot of control. What does that mean? So um, a plank is where you stand either on your forearms, you lie flat down and you lift your body up, either on your forearms or up on, up on, your, um, up on your hands. So you're in a, like an incline, a bit of an incline. And to hold your body upright in Ooh. that position for that amount of time requires a lot of core strength. Okay. And also, concentration. And concentration, strong joints, and a strong muscle. Your muscles in your body need to be so strong to hold you up, especially your core. And my ladies, you know what, they, they hold. I mean, I, I always say I've got my young ladies in my class who, yes, they're an inspiration to us, but you know what, they're young. Their bodies are just, they can do amazing things, things that maybe I can't even do, their bodies do. But when I look at my older ladies, that is my inspiration. When so they, you're never too young or never too no, old to join never, uh, ever, ever. Pilates. And when they come to me and tell me, Zaira, you know, I'm no longer using a chair for Salah. I'm actually going up and down. I can sit. My Ruku's, my Ruku position is uh, perfect. My Sijda is comfortable. Alhamdulillah. So for me, that is like the biggest reward. Okay, almost time to wrap up. Why is it that you think men are not drawn? You know, you, you, you talk about just the amazing benefits around mm. Pilates, and yet men are, don't seem to be drawn to this form of exercise. I think men have this notion that you need to pick up weights, okay. heavy weights, and you need to build your muscles. But what is holding, they concentrate on those big muscles, your biceps, your triceps, but there's all smaller muscles in between there that need to be worked as well. And I think because <laughs> social media has also put women as forefront is Pilates posters. So men feel, ah, it's a woman's thing. Uh -huh. uh, finally, in terms of Pilates, um, you spoke about men and lifting weights. Are there any apparatus or instruments that um, are involved in uh, Pilates exercises or is it just a free form exercise? No, so we do have Pilates equipment, which are those big equipment that look, they're quite big, the reformer, the Cadillac. Um, but you know what, all of those routines from these big apparatus can be done on a mat. So I do incorporate within my classes, I incorporate heat training. So your heart gets a bit of a workout as well. That's where the weight loss comes in. And then we use like um, the magic circle, uh, resistance bands, small balls, huge balls, all of these to create resistance within your body as well as weights. And women have to use weights. 
it's so important for us to build our muscle because when you build your muscle and you carry anything heavy in your body, your bones regenerate. And that is the only way to get your bones to be stronger is to pick something up. And we know the problem with women in osteoarthritis yes. and osteoporosis. I, so this is a way of definitely. combating it. Definitely. Wrap up time. How do people get hold of you? And um, when you sign up with you for Pilates, mm -hmm. what's the term? Do you have to be there for a month or three months or whatever? Definitely at least a month. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sure you'll get hooked onto it. And to see anything, to see the benefit of anything, you have to keep up with it. Absolutely. At least for three months for you to see any benefit and to see a change in your body. After 12 lessons of Pilates, you will definitely, most definitely see a change. After and one probably year, be hooked. You will, definitely. <laughs> Lovely definitely. talking to you. Thank, Thank you indeed you so for coming much. in and um, lots and lots of success ongoing success with your um, studio and i hope you're going to open up many more all around johannesburg inshallah inshallah nice talking to you zaida nice zaida ismail talking about the benefits of pilates i've always wanted to know about it and she's just unpacked it all on the show this morning and if you've promised yourself that it's already march march 2020 if you've promised that you're going to do something about your body You've just heard about the amazing benefits of Pilates, so perhaps you want to apply your mind to it. Welcome back, and our next two guests truly blew me away on our Wednesday show and I absolutely had to have them back in studio again whilst they are still here visiting in Johannesburg. They both hail from the Western Cape. Jasmine Khan is here to launch her book and uh, the moon is sighted and Najmunisa uh, Solomon is her counterpart. She'll tell us how this collaboration has happened. And she has been doing voluntary social work. She's worked with SADAC in the Western Cape for many, many years. Together, they have now formed what is called the Gap in Marriage program. They work on it. Um, they complement each other on these programs. And they're here again to pick up from where we left off on Wednesday's show. Salaamu Alaikum, welcome back to the show. I am so honored to have both you amazing ladies in my space. Just to add that on Monday was International Women's Day and I salute women like yourselves that are doing such amazing work in our communities. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and welcome to the program. Jasmine Khan and Najmunissa Solomon. Assalamu Alaikum to the viewers. It's an honor to be back, Julie. And um, please remember that what you see in us is only the veil that Allah has put across Amen. from us. Amen. So um, I get a bit nervous if people get too excited. <laughs> because I'll try not to <laughs> run away with my excitement. this is only through Allah's grace and kadr that uh, we are able to do what we do because absolutely we only have guidance from Allah. Absolutely. Now, Twinisa, obviously this is, you know, the two of you being in the studio really is a microcosm of our community, the Muslim community, not only in South Africa, but globally. Absolutely. It's suggesting to us that these are women of substance. Alhamdulillah, this is what the Muslim Ummah looks like as far as the mothers, the sisters, and the daughters of the Ummah is concerned. Shukran for that explanation. I love the way you said it. We are the women, uh, the Muslim women of, of, of the universe. Because the kind of things that myself and Jasmine have experienced, it's almost like we first had all the experiences in our lives that Allah Ta'ala tested us and, uh, upon and trained us upon before we could actually do the theory. So we had a lot of the practical experience of what the people are going through when they do come to us, where they are in the workshop. So through that, we could design an extract from the studies that we have done to put into a formula and in, in, in a manual that can speak to, that's people friendly and that's, that's 
user friendly as far as uh, linguistics is concerned, and grammar is concerned, and all of those things. It's not something that's high kaludi with academics only. I, there's one thing I've always learned from from my coach, my um, mentor, that she's a, she's very much my academic, and she is an academic, Antifosia Rycliffe, and she say, always says that academics are people that have learned a lot but know very little. So the grassroots people are the people that actually experience every atom of challenge that you can ever imagine of and how do they emotionally become intelligent to survive those things. So when they sit in the classroom, the first time I sat in a, a lecture room, I thought, but how does this man know my life? Why is wow. he talking about my stuff? And eventually it was about everybody else's stuff that was around. So the things that we address is directly grassroots. You can be a, a, a lecturer, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever you are, you are still a human being at the end Absolutely. of the day. So you can have all the tags of all the things that you've achieved but who are you without those things Absolutely. and that's the person we try to reach so if you come and sit in my in, in a counseling session and I'm asking who am I who am I seeing here who am I addressing and you tell me oh I'm I'm a lecturer of this and I'm a teacher of that and I'm a doctor of this and so okay so can we just remove all those labels can we put it down there and now we're I speaking who to now you? and they cannot tell you who they are Mm. So first of all, because we kind of almost tie our personalities in with our professions, absolutely. because without that, we feel we are nothing that defines who we are. And that's oh, totally oh. wrong. That concept is totally oh, no. upside down. Jasmine, what do you want to say to that? Um, as I said to you on the Wednesday show, what has happened to you and what is what is said to you does not define who you are. Nothing and nobody can change the pureness of you, the fitra that Allah granted to you. And um, we are too prone to live up to other people's expectations. It starts off from the cradle, when the parents' expectations, then we go to school, this is the peer pressure, then you go and work, <clears throat> and you have to be, you have to dress like your colleagues, you have to have your hair done the way your colleagues are. And so we, build this false persona and we don't live authentic lives. We, we, we're always putting on layer upon layer upon layer upon layer and until eventually if anybody wants to reach us, when you're up there, they have to come right Ooh. down. You practically need an escalator to find the <laughs> correct person, the, right. the real true self. And this is something that we need to stop it, you know, because we are beautiful, we are divine. I think we're too afraid of judgment. We, too af we want to be accepted. We want to be known as having arrived, so to speak. But having said all of that, I just love what you spoke to me about on Wednesday about the Gaps in Marriage program. We touched briefly on module one, and I'd like you to unpack very briefly the other modules together with Jasmine. But what I do want to ask is, how does your program Compare, apart from obviously the Islamic ethos that's brought into it, with such programs that has been running in non-Islamic circles. I know Christian churches have been running these premarital and counseling programs for years on end. And it seems we as the community have only just started embracing these concepts and not a moment too late because it is sorely needed in our communities. Yes, absolutely. It's it's very much needed, and fortunately, we have the we have it available on our on our heads in our pubs of our as born heads. Muslims, hey? As born Muslims, unfortunately, the the culture that is interpreted as part of the religion is overlapping the Quran and the Sunnah, and we 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 so quickly fall into that culture part of what is the role of the female and what is the role of the male. So we try to. Except that we do not want to refuse the values that we've been brought to by our ancestors and our forefathers because the values are extremely good. It's the perception and the false belief that comes with the value. So your values formulates your perception. 
I'm only judgmental because I judged myself first. Absolutely. I only have a perception of you because I have a perception of me. And so on and so on. So the, the values formulate your perception, but your values, perceptions formulate your belief. And those beliefs can be false. So what we do, we try to remove the false belief and the perception we change. You're talking self-belief, obviously. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what, whoever comes to you and they have this idea of marriage and what is my role and what is your role, we try to gently accept you first, but to inculcate the Quran and the Sunnah and bring up the examples like, for instance, the, 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 the mothers of the believers, the mothers of the former daibs, the, the, the powerful examples of women's roles in the yesteryear times. It is our role models. It is the authenticness of who we are. They've gone through no different than what we are going through. So many of them have been single parents, but it's hard for them to accept themselves in a society that oppress them of who they're going to become or who they are. The way they dress, if they are divorced or married, if they had a child out of wedlock, if they have a relationship, the perception of the person is what we want to remove. Sadly, very sadly, and it shouldn't be so in the Muslim community, but we do live in a very, very patriarchal society. That has to change. And I'm wondering if you cover that in your, uh, in your program, Absolutely. The Gaps in Marriage, Absolutely. how do you address that and which module is that? <laughs> <laughs> that is immediately the second module that I was going to talk about. When we speak about temperaments, um, personality, capacity, and uh, character building your, your, your beliefs that you've learned from your forefathers. So we take you through a train, uh, coaches of the train, what was, who was the most important people in your life during from 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15. So whatever you say, those people in there, you'll make a note of that, and that we, we process with you in the class. So we, I'll make the notes, uh, the diagrams on the, on the newsprint and say, so you've learned values from all of those people that was important in your life. But when you come to a certain stage in your life, 14 to 21, that 15 teenage stage, parents become less important. Friends become more important. When a child goes to school at the age of seven, teacher almost becomes more important than one mother do because the child comes home and says, my teacher said I must have it tomorrow. And mommy is moaning about this teacher's authority that they have over the child. But the, at that time, that teacher is important to that child. So the child is going to capture so many of the values of that particular person. So they got a pot full of values. So what, what perceptions are going to come from the, the And the vulnerability, uh, vulnerability at that point in time. Because There's already where it starts. Yes. Because everybody's born pure. A child is born purely innocent. Is what we as adults are going to teach these child and they don't learn from what we teach them. They learn from what they see we doing. Absolutely. Jasmine, can I come to you? Um, and I'm just uh, swapping from no, both brother. of you because of co time constraints. The role or the child that grows up um, in a situation uh, with without a father. So you have this absent father syndrome. How damaging is that if he doesn't have a strong enough role model? It is perf uh, perf very damaging because the, the child needs both role, role models, the mother and the father. The mother is a constant in the child's life, although of course in the modern world it's not like that, but it's supposed to be. The mother is the constant. The father is, uh, teaches the child that I love you, but at some point I'm going to go away and I'm going to return. So the child learns to trust. My dad is not here now, but he's coming home this evening. So if you don't have that father figure, the child never learns that there is something like uh, something that's not constant, but it is permanent. And that child will constantly have that emptiness within him or her uh, because it is something that is essential for their development. And what frequently happens, especially in young girls, they will be attracted to an older figure. And it will not be so much that they love the person for that, but it is they are fulfilling a certain role in their life. An emptiness in their in life. The, an emptiness in mm -hmm. their life. Okay, when we get back uh, from the ad break, Najmini what I'd like you to respond to is the issue around the absent father role in a man's life. So when he comes to marriage classes, what is it that you unpack with them? And what are the pitfalls that you may see in his relationship with his future wife or his wife? 
Amazing ladies talking about the most amazing of uh, subjects. We're talking about uh, gaps, the gaps in marriage. It's a course being run, an eight-week course being run in the Western Cape. But also we do know that here in Johannesburg, Islamic Care Line and other such organizations are running marriage classes as well. It may not be exactly the same, but there is absolutely something in place for you to attend to strengthen your marital bonds with your partner. This is a discussion that could go on for the entire day because it is so full of value and importance that all of us need to be embracing so that we have healthier relationships, healthier families and healthier communities. Natwenisa, I posed a question to you to respond to now about the absent father figure and how that impacts on that child or that young man who's going to enter into marriage. The, the important part about what we need to see as an absent father, parenting is not about you and the child, not at all. The child's immune, emotional immune system is needy of a good relationship between the two people that have been a part of his creation. So he will have a void in his life if any one of the two is not a part of it. So when he sees them either divorced, married, um, unmarried or whatever it is, but they have a civil relationship. They're putting all their adult stuff aside and they're addressing what is necessary for the children to see. So that's a tough cookie because unfortunately when it comes to divorce, the, 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 the child becomes the target that they play with, the kingpin, the mover. That or they even move if it's not match. a divorce, if it's just a very tumultuous relationship, Absolutely. fighting all the time, in a, it's going to impact going to on the now, child. In the marriage, in the household, in the marriage, there is a lot more damage being done to the child. All of us have it. I've had it. She's had it. We've all had it. How did we not change, but how did we grow in the relationship? Staying who we are and our authenticness, but being able to allow ourselves to grow emotionally, to understand the EQ. Because IQ, you get free. It's there with you when you are born. But emotional intelligence comes from the relationship of the two parents that the child are seeing. So you get IQ free from Allah. You come out, you can build a house at a couple of years' time without having to be educated about it. But your EQ, your emotional intelligence, is what comes after you were born and what you are seeing when you play tennis and watching the two parents. What about a very damaged person, male or female, come from a very um, unstable home or a very unstable upbringing, has had very bad negative experiences in life and you now have this product who is not emotional intelligent. Is it too late for that not person? Ever too late. How do you help fix them? Both of us are examples of that. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. If you want to fix yourself, it is so important to first realize, like they say, if you're alcoholic, you must admit I am. If you've grown up like that, I think 95 or 97% of us, or maybe 99.5 of us, have grown up in that kind of environment. Absolutely. When we get married, I always say in the marriage class, we get married because we claim we're adults. We're now going to do adult things. So why do we start behaving like children after we have the child? Ooh. So go back and we look at the inner child in you. What does that child now take out of you? The only thing that you know how to do is what you've seen your parents have done, your aunties and uncles have done, and all those people in the train that you filled in is going to be a part of that child's life that you now know how. For me personally, it felt extremely, extremely uncomfortable. I would cry if I've done something to my child. I want to apologize. And I was a toxic parent to a large extent. And that is why the parent center was a longing for me to get to. But of course, it was in a apartheid time. I couldn't go there as a colored to go and get the causes or the information. And Alhamdulillah, the day I could get there, up till today, I would apologize for certain toxic behaviors of myself. And this is the beautiful thing that parents can do to their adult children and saying that I'm sorry, I've done the best as what I knew how at that time. If you have a problem child, and it is due to the fact that you were not a good enough parent, that you were a toxic parent, Jasmine, 
you want to now make amends. How do you go about doing that through your marriage classes and other means without the person then manipulating you, taking advantage of the situation, but, you know, realizes the beauty and the worth you're trying to achieve here to help make her whole again? Julie, the thing is that we as parents underestimate our children. We also have this fear that because we did something that is wrong or we were neglectful, that it's not really our job to apologize to them. I mean, seriously, I'm the mother and you're the child. That's the kind of attitude. I found that when you actually talk to your children and explain to them, we always say, that was then, this is now. I did the best I could with the knowledge I had, I now know better, so I'm going to try to do better. And in the majority of cases, if you're honest with your child and you, and you sincerely ask them for forgiveness, it's not a matter of, you know, a throwaway thing, I'm so sorry, I was such a bad parent. You have to actually repent sincerely and your child will respect you all the more for the fact that my mother or my father, but I don't think the fathers are so very <laughs> keen to do that. I know in my case it wasn't. But the thing is that they respect you more. We, we have this attitude that our children are another species, that they're not on our level because, you know, the old people who say, you're the child, I'm the adult. And we need to get rid of that. We, we need to wipe that off the hard drive completely. If we claim we're the adult, why then are we, we must, not behaving we like, must an behave adult? like that? Najmanisa, let me uh, let me ask you before we run out of time, and this is so very important. We've covered two modules. Uh, what does the I, balance I, of the eight modules cover very quickly? I'll tell you quickly. The first and second one deals, and the third even, deals with everything about getting you to know yourself. Getting to know and understand why I am the way that and I am. And do people accept Absolutely. that if they've got a horrible like, side aha, to themselves? If they selfish, if they're narcissistic, Absolutely. if they manipulate us, etc. So the next module is self-esteem. It's the definition of self-esteem. They get a questionnaire paper of 20 questions that is normal questions that you just throw at them and they have to score themselves there's four scores and at the end of the day it will add up and it will tell them exactly what category their self-esteem falls in after that the second time they get but you have to be honest with yourself look the whole thing there is about why are you here are you truthful to yourself that covers the first three modules okay so if you're coming back after the third uh, session of our workshop then we know you want to go further than this you want to understand you first so the whole program is about getting to know me and being okay with me and others so we all have a 20 percent and we have 80 percent so if you entertain my 20 percent it will become my 80 percent but if you take my 20 percent with a pinch of salt and say it comes out under circumstances that will appear but your 80% is so beautiful and so good, I'm going to constantly remind my child about the 80% and not about the 20%. Right. Where we are encouraged or grew up with the idea of entertaining everybody's 20%. Where mother walks into the house, father walks the in. The negatives. They only see what the children haven't done. They don't see what they have done. And we in a relationship is exactly the same. We see what our husbands are not giving us and not doing for us, but we're not seeing what they are doing and what they are giving. The same with the spouse on the other side. So if we look at the 80% of everybody, we'll have a beautiful life. Alhamdulillah. But we are entertaining constantly the 20%. The so that grows to the 80%. Okay. And the 20% just go of, of, the, of the nice part of the person has now stooped down into the 20%. So look at ourselves and constantly do a SWOT analysis on yourself. What is my strength? What is my weaknesses? What is my opportunities? And what is my threats? Absolutely. Why can work I not? On them. Work why on them. can I not get that? Why am I still here? Is my ego operating from... Now, that's another topic on its own, and I can speak about another hour. It's where you are stuck in your emotional side of your brain or on your intellectual side of your brain. And why do you operate from that side? Because there's certain endorphins. Allah has created this so beautiful. All the machinery is intact. Harun Yahya has a beautiful program called The Miracles of Hormones. I've done it many years ago. And there he calls it the factory. Every molecule, every atom has has its space. There's somebody that wrote a book now in Cape Town, uh, Mani, his surname is Mani, um, uh, I can't get to his first name now, where he explains this. The other person is Dr. Arnold, Dr. Fadil Arnold, that 
to the T goes into detail with how we create it. So who disrupts that method? So when the child gets brought up, is the child being fulfilled from the different stages, 0 to 7, 7 to 14, and from 14 to 21? Okay, let me move you on. That would be module 4. That will be module 4. Self-esteem goes to module 4, 5, and almost 6. Right. 7 and 8 is all to do with self-esteem. Oh, um, um, relationships so the whole dynamic about what is a healthy relationship what is an unhealthy relationship how do we engage and like take care Give of yourself us three points on healthy and three points on unhealthy okay. relationships. so the healthy relationship is first of all to respect honor and be truthful to yourself first because we teach people how to treat us People only treat you the way you perceive and the way you appear to come into this. If you come into a space, if your mouth is hanging, if your husband comes in by the door and you look like this, what are you saying? What energy are you giving over? The same with him of when he comes in. So how do we kind of pass by that energy? It's because we are about energy. We nothing but energy. Negative and positive. Absolutely. And if you maintain positive energy, you allow your brain cells to operate in a most productive kind of way. But if you are negative, you're actually deteriorating your brain cells and your body stops producing a certain endorphins that makes you happy. So eventually you'll find yourself in a depression, you'll find yourself in a low, and your body will eventually stop. I have children 13, 14 years old that, that doesn't make any dopamine and serotonin any longer. These children in kindergarten, God and that's depressed. Why? We need to go back okay. and see, like you asked earlier on, what is the mom and what is the dad's issues? Right. How can we marry them? Not just marriage Absolutely. by legally. But We've come almost to the end of the show. Oh, what is the final module then? And the final then I'll module is switch the most over to Jasmine. Beautiful module. It's called forgiveness therapy. Ah, alhamdulillah. Can we truly forgive and move on? You know, Forgiveness therapy is about bending without breaking it, but being re resilient enough to bounce back. Now, the three different temperaments, the same as the four different madhaibs, I want to show you the correlation between the two. Mola Dawood and myself did a program on A, Voice of the Cape, on the, the temperaments of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it was our example for us to see how we handled that wife, how we handled that temperament, and how we handled, how we engaged with him, tells us how to manage those temperaments. We each one have a formula, but you know, Julie, the formula has been kept away from us. That's why we, we damaged. The formula is there for the mother at the clinic to be introduced and say, this was the process of your child's birth. He came out rapidly, uh, fast movements, high pitch voice, so you can expect the feisty child. But Ooh. the feisty child's temperament is, do things away from me. Don't rush me. Don't push me. Don't be in my face. The same is with a slow to process child. The slow to process child comes out mellow and long dance and a poor <laughs> kind of a cry. And that's your slow to process child. What is his formula? Do things close to me. Come and explain the thing closer to me, but give me the time. And I'm going to have to stop you there. <laughs> your closing words on the show this morning, Jasmine. Okay. <laughs> Julie, I just feel that this is a subject we can talk about endlessly. Of course. And it is a pity that we are in Cape Town, but Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, I'm very happy that we were able to uh, come on the show and uh, maybe whet the people's appetite. Inshallah. And maybe there will be women out there who will take up the, the reins and do these programs themselves. Amen. Amen. I must tell you that we started these programs about 15 years ago and today there is a proliferation of life coaches and uh, counsellors and Not things sure and the, the seeds were planted and now it's coming to fruition and we're very, very, very grateful. Absolutely. We'll be able Good to luck do. on the book launch Michelle. and a final word from you, Ruxana. Uh, Nach I beg your pardon. <laughs> I will just like to say to everybody, whatever you do, even the butter on your bread, do it for the sake of Allah. Amin, Thumma, Amin. It's been an honor to have you both on my show oh, wow. today. Very You've true. given me food for thought and I have no doubt in my mind you've truly uh, awakened the senses in all the people watching us mm -hmm. this morning. Mm -hmm. Let us go out, start looking at ourselves, inner selves, outer selves, and start making the changes. Let us be the change Tastia. we want to see around us. Amen. Amen to my amen. There you have it, the most amazing ladies from 
the Western Cape. Undoubtedly, there are as many amazing Muslimas all around the world. We just need to tap into them and make this an absolutely great community. We thank them from the bottom of our hearts and inshallah, may they continue their amazing work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept their efforts. Hello everyone from the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. My name is Alexander Kuzmanovic and it's my pleasure to have with us today Dr. Rosmond Lewis. Hi. Hi. Who will actually respond your questions on COVID-19 in workplace. So we are saying that uh, WHO is saying that uh, responding to COVID-19 outbreak, it's not job just for health sector. So we are working with different industries representatives um, and different sectors uh, to respond to the outbreak. And please uh, feel free to ask your questions through the comment section here on Facebook or to hashtag AskWHO on Twitter um, on how you can protect if your employer, how to uh, protect your employees from COVID-19 or if your employee any other interest you have on this subject, please um, ask your questions. Um, before we receive questions from, from viewers, um, would you tell us what is the role that employers can play in the COVID-19 response? Employers can play a very important role in uh, preparing for or responding to any situation where people are concerned about coronavirus disease, COVID-19. That is both whether there's a case in your community or not, even if people are just concerned about it. Uh, thank you very much. Would you remind our viewers first how COVID-19 spreads? COVID-19 is what we call a respiratory uh, infection, which means it can be spread by coughing, the droplets that you spray a little bit when you talk or when you cough or when you sneeze. So it does not travel long distances, but it does travel about this far to the person next to you. And so it's really important for people to uh, keep a distance of about a meter or so, three, three four feet, uh, from someone who's coughing or sneezing because that is how you can uh, catch these uh, infections. Thank you, Rosamund. Um, so what are the simple public health actions that employers can put in place to protect their employees or their business partners? Sure, Alexandra. So in the first instance, the public health actions that the employer can put in place are the same as for everyone else. The number one action is hand washing. This can be done with soap and water and it can be done with hand sanitizers, alcohol-based hand rubs. To do that as often as possible, certainly before eating, before or after uh, handling maybe door handles or elevator buttons, things that are touched frequently by other people, especially during the winter months in the Northern Hemisphere or likewise in other parts of the world. It is from these frequently touched places that uh, people can acquire viral infections. So it's really important to wash your hands, but equally important not to touch your face afterwards. Uh, or, I mean, before, when your hands may be dirty. So pe what people don't realize how often uh, we touch our faces, our nose, our eyes. And so it's really important to just try and remember to control that impulse. Keep your hands clean. Don't touch your eyes, nose, or your face, or your mouth and uh, keep a distance from anyone who is coughing or sneezing. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, are there any actions that employers should do if COVID-19 arrived in their communities? Absolutely. Because this is an infection that can infect uh, almost anyone, there's some things that are important to know. One is that still, most people who acquire this infection actually have a very mild illness. And uh, that's just to reassure you that it, it can be very serious in some people, but most people have a mild case. So for those uh, where it is serious, it tends to be the older, older folks. Um, as we get older, we are more vulnerable to all kinds of infections, and this is no exception. So employers can provide information to uh, employees through a whole range of means. So one is posters that you can put up in your workplace, communication messages through email, this kind of uh, information medium through social media. And also what's really helpful is to have uh, perhaps a talk in your workplace, depending on the size of your workplace, either from your uh, occupational health and safety support office or from your uh, staff health services. If you're 
business is small and you don't have that kind of support, you can reach out to a local health care provider or to your local public health unit. Uh, there are many um, professionals in the community who would probably be happy to help with this. Thank you very much. Um, so once again, just a reminder for everyone, today we are talking about COVID-19 in workplace. So feel free to ask your questions to our expert, Dr. Rosmond Lewis. Um, can you also explain to our viewers, please, um, what if someone needs to go on a business trip? What are the actions to take or what is the, the information they need, to, they need to know? Absolutely, so there are things that you can do. First of all, what we're saying is that it's, you need to assess the risk. So is this business trip necessary? What is the location? Has COVID-19 been reported there? Is it possible to hold this meeting through any other means, whether it be video conferences or teleconferences? If the person needs to go, then there are means to protect uh, the traveler by preparing them before the trip, during the trip, and when they come back. So before the trip, you want to make sure that uh, they have the maximum amount of information available, the latest information available on where COVID-19 is being reported. Of course, busy places like uh, airports or train stations, they can of course uh, pose a slightly higher risk. So it's really all about managing that risk, being prepared, being aware, and then when you're in a destination, make sure to follow the uh, requirements or the recommendations of the local authorities. They can be public health authorities, they can be security, police, but when you're somewhere where a situation may evolve very quickly, uh, be aware that you may need to follow the instructions of the local authorities. It's uh, not necessary to wear a mask. I'm sure many of you will uh, be interested in that. The, the mask is really mostly helpful for people who are already coughing because it protects other people from the results of that cough. Uh, the most of the masks that are that are out there right now, the thin surgical masks, uh, they don't really protect directly and it may be that we are using too many masks um, because who really needs the masks is the health workers, the nurses and doctors who are treating people in hospital. So we recommend that you use a mask if you're already sick or if you're looking after someone who's sick. But otherwise we're not recommending masks in a general sense. Uh, thank you very much. We also meanwhile received a question on uh, masks, if you can just clarify as well, not when traveling but in the workplace that maybe community is affected by COVID-19. Uh, do you still yes. recommend that employees should all wear masks or, or not? Now remember that COVID-19 is one type of infectious virus. There are others. There are common cold viruses, we could name a few, there's the flu season. Uh, these are all infections that spread in a similar way through the mechanisms that we've already talked about. So it's important if someone does actually have symptoms, whether they have a cough or fever or a runny nose, that ideally they would just stay home. If they're not that sick, you could offer that they telework from home. Ideally, they would not be in the workplace uh, where they can infect others. If they are in the workplace, then again, if someone is actually having these kind of respiratory symptoms, we would suggest that the person who's not well is the one who's wearing the mask, not everyone else. And there's another reason for that is that we've um, seen that when people wear masks, it's unusual, it's uncomfortable, it's not something they're used to. And in fact, you may be ending up touching your face more often than without wearing one. So you maybe want to adjust it. And then of course, by the time your, your mask may become damp, um, in fact, you can, that mask can spread the infection even more easily, especially if it's not put on properly, removed properly, uh, disposed of properly in a closed bin. So we don't want to cause greater risk by everyone wearing masks uh, for long periods of time. So if you are going to use one, then please do check what is the right way to wear it and the right way to dispose of it. Thank you very much. Uh, this was really great uh, explanation. Um, we are getting more and more questions and uh, here is one from Laura Patricia Lopez Meneses. Uh, are there any special recommendations for employees from airports? Well, that's a very good question. So an airport is a workplace like any other. And again, it's about risk. So what is the risk in your workplace? What is happening in your community? And clearly an airport or a train station may be a place where more people are passing. Now, if you're just passing someone in, you know, if it's not that crowded or you're not that close, just passing someone in a shopping mall or in an airport is not something that's gonna increase your risk. But if you are uh, at the front lines and you're actually screening, passengers who are coming, you are approaching them, you are taking their temperature perhaps, or you're asking questions, and you may be just less than a meter, or hopefully not less than a meter. Uh, you want to uh, be mindful 
that you may wish to wear a mask in that situation if you think you're coming in contact with people who uh, you are screening, especially if it's likely that the contact may be reduced to uh, less than three feet. Thank you very much. We have a next question from Estemarie Luna Vargas from Dominican Republic. What's the best way to practice prevention in a call center setting where headsets are shared and facilities are closed and air is recycled? So, oh, another very great question. So in a, in a setting where you may be um, constantly touching surfaces, we didn't talk a lot about surfaces yet. So when somebody coughs or sneezes, the droplets may drop on whatever's in front of you, whether it be your desk, a table, a telephone. Um, and so in those circumstances where you are likely to be touching surfaces, especially if they've been touched by others, that you want to do everything in your workplace to keep those surfaces clean. So regular disinfectant with just ordinary uh, kitchen <laughs> disinfectants, uh, chlorine, that sort of thing, really simple things. But doing it regularly is the important thing. So uh, making sure that your, your desk and surface area is clean. If you're coming into a workspace, a booth maybe, that somebody else has been using, you want to be careful. You don't want to be too worried, but you want to be careful. Then feel free to use wipes or, or regular disinfectants to clean the surface. Thank you. Um, there comes a question from Sergio, Sergio Lopez Lara. What is the recommended frequency for wiping surfaces with disinfectants? Again, uh, there may not be a, an absolute answer to that. It may be, is it your workspace? Maybe you do it at the frequency that you're comfortable with, once a day, twice a day, once every two or three days. But if you're sharing that workspace with other people, then how frequent how frequently is that workspace exchanged? And mm -hmm. have you seen anyone in the vicinity coughing or sneezing? Uh, you don't necessarily want to wait for that, but uh, if, if, it's a, if it's a heavily trafficked workspace, mm -hmm. then you might want to do it more often, maybe several times a day. Thank you very much. Um, here's a very good next question. Uh, what about library where people bo uh, are borrowing books? So books are a type of surface which first of all if they're on the shelf and they're there for several mm -hmm. days or weeks or months then most of them are not likely to be infected in any way secondly they won't also be infected if there's no COVID-19 in your community so unless there's COVID-19 in your community it's not something you need to worry about at all and finally books tend to have um, if it's a more of a porous surface uh, it's possible that the virus doesn't survive as long on that surface if you are really concerned, you can wear gloves. If you're dealing with mm -hmm. materials that you feel are being touched often by others, you could wear a pair of gloves, but again, be very careful. When you remove those gloves, first of all, don't touch your face with the gloves, and secondly, remove those gloves carefully and bin them in a closed bin so that you're not reinfecting yourself from the surface of the gloves. But in most cases, you wouldn't need to worry about this. There's still relatively few cases around mm -hmm. the world. We are seeing outbreaks. We're seeing uh, outbreaks in, in specific countries and we're seeing a, a sporadic case here and there. For the vast majority of you watching this right now, it's not something you should worry about. Thank you very much. Uh, we got the next question from a viewer on Twitter uh, who says that he works with clients with poor respiratory hygiene. So his question is what, what should he do, he or she do? With the clients? Yes. Well, it would be helpful to know what, what, why that person has uh, what type of client, so I, I don't have the answer to that question. But depending on the type of client, if it's someone who maybe is ill or coughing and you have no choice but to be in very close proximity to them, uh, you may want to share with them the fact that you don't feel like shaking hands because you're concerned about uh, what's happening right now. Um, but uh, don't be too worried. Just say that right now you're not shaking hands with anyone. Or you might say that uh, we appreciate if we just keep a distance of, uh, of a, a meter or so, or you may wish to place your client across a table from you, and you may wish to, to limit the time that you're with them uh, to a shorter period of time. And really, as I said before, for most people, this is not a concern, but definitely there are other viruses that can be transmitted in this way. So that practice, those practices are always, always good. You can ask them to cough into their sleeve. We haven't talked about that yet either, that when people are coughing or sneezing, ask them to do this. You do not want to cough into your own hands and then go and shake someone else's hands. That is a no-no. You really, you really have to protect <laughs> others from your own cough and sneeze, and you can politely ask others to do the same. So let's just... Um, summarize here what are the main ways of protecting uh, ourselves and others from getting sick what hand washing and so what are the other other tips you, you recommend right. so absolutely hand washing absolutely uh, keeping your hands away from your face uh, you may um, use a Kleenex if you're not comfortable with the with the elbow 
but if you do that, bin the Kleenex immediately. Don't leave it lying around. Keep your surfaces tidy and clean them regularly with disinfectant. These are many ways in which mm -hmm. you, can, uh, you can protect yourself. And for the workplace specifically, really if you are an employer and you're watching this, you should consider what are the risks in your office? What is the traffic in your office? What are the offices like? Are they uh, cubicles? Are they closed offices? If it's an office, it could be a different type of workplace altogether. And then manage the risk accordingly by informing your staff uh, and your clients, of course, yes, uh, of, of these simple measures that really will protect all of us. Of assessing the risk that you have when people are traveling for business or even traveling for family mm -hmm. reasons. Uh, they want to be aware before they travel, when they travel, and also when they come back. They want to be aware of, of any risk they may have been exposed to. And go and discuss it with your um, staff health or occupational health services. And then you want to also consider maybe having a preparedness plan or a business continuity plan. Because if, if COVID does arrive in your community, you may be uh, now uh, listening to your health authorities say, okay, we need to maximize the number of people that are staying home for whatever reason, or you can't travel in and out of a location. Again, this is not happening in very many places. But it would be a good idea to start working on a business continuity plan so that you can have policies in place. Who can telework? When should they telework? Uh, and, and various things like that. Do, do all people need to be in at the same time? Can, can the work be spaced out? And it may depend if it's, a, if it's a manufacturer, it's a different situation. But again, lessening the number of people that are coming and going, uh, especially in a circumstance like that, can be very helpful to reduce the risk for your uh, office and your company. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have a very relevant question coming from Ruder Avenado Buluran. Uh, he says that a lot of employees are commuters and it worries them especially um, as they don't know who they encounter with while they commute. And then uh, the question is, should companies activate remote working if available instead of wait for a worse outbreak? So this should quite different questions there because we just talked about remote working I'll address that one first so the remote working it's uh, it's up to the company policy uh, you need to know what is the comfort level in your company mm -hmm. but if it's something that you put in place ahead of receiving uh, COVID-19 or another infectious disease in your community then it's something that you can practice you can work on mm -hmm. it people get used to it managers especially can get used to having their employees working from a distance you can fine-tune those policies so that when you do have to implement them, if that becomes the case, then you're actually more comfortable doing so. So practicing that uh, and having policies in place in advance of any emergency is actually a really good thing. Then the second question was about public transport. So for public transport, that's well, a concerning question because you are there in a bus or a train and, and, and you, you feel that you're crowded in. But the same rules apply. If you're touching the pole, of course, we don't want you to fall over and have an accident. So by all means, make sure first that you're safe and secure. So hold on tight, um, but then don't put that hand to your face. Keep it by your side until you get home and wash your hands. Or you can have a little bottle of sanitizer or you can have wipes mm -hmm. in your pocket. And if you feel that you've exposed yourself to um, an unhygienic or frequently touched environment, then you can deal with that straight away. So that's a, a good plan. Um, and then in terms of crowding, that's up to you as an individual to decide, are you getting on that bus or you're not getting on that bus? Um, but of course, if you are on the bus, make sure that you protect your own cough with a tissue or with your own mm -hmm. elbow and protect the others around you and uh, just try not to be close to someone who is coughing or ask them quietly to do the same, to protect others by coughing into their elbow. Thank you very much. Uh, here comes in the next question. What's your advice for employees who have business meetings in affected countries? So this is a very really good question. Uh, whether to plan a meeting or not is uh, an important question. So the first question, of course, for the employer is, how important is this meeting? Does it need to go ahead? The second thing is, how can this meeting be held in a way which reduces risk? Because remember, we're just managing the risk. And the risk may be very close to zero, but it's never zero. So how do we manage that risk? You can manage it by having some people telework or mm -hmm. video conference in. You can manage it by having a webinar. If you're going to have it by having a meeting in your premises, it depends on the size of the meeting and how many people are attending. A really good practice is simply to make, mm -hmm. make sure everyone knows where the washrooms are, make um, the dispensers of the hand sanitizers available at strategic locations. You could have your staff health services come in and give a 
two-minute talk at the beginning of the meeting to say that you're all aware that there's a, there's a situation in your environment and these are, the, these are the practices that we're going to be put in place during the meeting so that everyone is protected. And then, of course, the important thing is part of your preparedness plan should be to know who to call should you have any concern. Um, what to say when you call. So it's good to plan this in advance. If you're having a meeting, by all means, go ahead. Contact your public health authority or your health services or your healthcare provider in advance to say, here's what we're doing, you know, what advice would you have for us? Or maybe you can just find it on their website. What advice would you have for us if, uh, if we have a situation and we need to call you? If you do have a situation, has that question come up yet? No, not yet. <laughs> If you do have a situation and someone in your workplace is unwell and they're coughing and sneezing and you don't really know where they've come from or you do know where they've come from and you're concerned, just make sure that part of your plan is to have a, a location where you can put them. It could be apart from the others. It could be a, someone's office. It could be a nursing station. Um, it could be a location where just so that managing risk, remember, is also managing the perception of risk. So you're not just managing the actual risk. You're managing how people feel how they react, what they think. And so your best move is just to have a place where you can ask mm -hmm. someone to sit quietly, depending on how ill they are, um, and know how to handle that situation while everybody else just goes on with their business. I'm taking a message here that uh, actually employers have an important role as well about, about in communicating with their employees the risks, right? Thank you. Um, we have a next question. Uh, what is your advice for social workers who are exposed in poor communities? Someone who's working in a poor community may be exposed to a different type of environment, but basically it's the same situation whenever you're working with someone. Uh, if you feel that there's a situation that is evolving, that you need to call someone, uh, know in advance who you're going to call mm -hmm. or what you're going to do. Uh, if uh, I think that our, our emergency services mm -hmm. certainly are, will be fully trained, paramedics and, and emergency vehicles will be fully trained as to know what to do. But most of the time, there's no reason to suspect that there's any higher risk in a poor community than any other community. Everyone, it can be equally affected, and the vast mm -hmm. majority of people right now are not at risk mm -hmm. at all. Uh, so it's the basic common practices of protecting yourself and helping to protect other people so that uh, you're not coughing on them and they're not coughing on you and that would be the number one thing again hands don't touch your face keep them clean mm -hmm. and you can protect yourself and the people you're working with whatever community you're in um, there is a question as well how are cleaning work workers being trained to properly clean and des desinfect surfaces in the event of a broader outbreak so that's an important thing you need to consider in your preparedness plan and in fact it should be a discussion that you're having already with your cleaning services as to how are they actually doing it right now? Are they doing a good job of cleaning surfaces? Are they, are you have concerns? Let them actually just describe to you what they're already doing. Mm -hmm. And then have a conversation with them because after all, they're the professionals. Mm -hmm. And so they should be able to advise you as to what, uh, what they think they, should, they can do differently if they need to uh, ramp things up or just um, have a conversation so that you actually know. Because the, the biggest source of fear is the unknown. And if you don't know what your mm -hmm. cleaning services are doing, then it's a good time to ask mm -hmm. them. Thank you very much. Uh, we are getting uh, several questions on uh, what about gyms where, where everybody is touching everything when they are doing their training. So one of the things about this disease that I feel that it's important to share with you is that what we have learned is that when people are becoming ill with, and I'm going to talk about COVID-19 right now. I mean, there, there are different infectious diseases out there as we've already mentioned several times. But for COVID-19, what we've learned is that the onset, the beginning of the illness can be very mild. It can be a low grade fever. It can be a dry cough, a slight cough. And so when people are, if someone is becoming ill with this, it can be quite mild to begin with. And in fact, they can be out and about. They can look well to other people. They may take uh, a medication mm -hmm. to make themselves feel better and uh, they may continue going about their business. So this is something specific that we've learned about this illness, that people can have mild symptoms and transmit. So the important thing is not to worry over much about this, but to realize that even if someone is only mildly unwell, they could still um, spread it mm -hmm. if they have it. Of course, if they don't have it, they can't spread it. But if they have it, this is a situation. So it is a possibility, there is a chance, that somebody could still be well enough to go to the gym and so on. Again, what is the situation in your community? Has anything been reported in your community? And number two, standard practices. 
If you're working at a gym, that's fantastic. It's great for your health. Keep it up. Just keep your hands clean mm -hmm. and don't touch your face when you're working with the gym. Go straight to the uh, locker rooms afterwards and, and clean up and then you'll be fine. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question coming on. What about the uh, situations inside the plane? both for flight attendants and passengers. Are there any special recommendations? So there are special recommendations. They're already online on the WHO website, which is uh, www.who.int. So there, uh, this work is being done not alone by WHO, but in conjunction with uh, the International Air Transport Association and other uh, industry leaders who are already um, making information available to uh, specific cadres of, of uh, workers and this is the airline industry is obviously one of them so the airlines will all have their methods that they're putting in place to protect their help their workers as well as their passengers thank you very much um, Rahul Pradhan is asking does good air circulation reduce risk of COVID-19 transmission in a workplace if yes would open windows be better or use of AC it's a good question. We don't think at the moment that COVID-19 is being transmitted through ventilation systems. It doesn't seem to be the main driver of the outbreaks. The outbreaks are being driven primarily by person-to-person, -person, mm -hmm. direct person-to-person -person transmission through respiratory droplets. So ventilating a, an open space is, is always a good idea. It's always a good idea to have fresh air coming in. Um, probably open windows are just fine. Mm -hmm. There's no need to have air conditioning on specifically. And uh, again, the same measures apply. Thank you very much. Um, can infected, Jenny Weber is asking, can infected persons spread the disease when they are touching items around us? For example, a credit card machine at our local store or when they're checking out? So the concern about the spread from the virus on surfaces is, is a legitimate concern and it's, uh, it's what everybody's worried about. Again, it, things that are frequently touched could hypothetically be a source of concern. Right now the virus, what we know about it, which remember this didn't exist eight weeks ago, so we're learning a lot and we're learning fast. Um, and we're sharing everything we're learning with you. Uh, but sometimes we may say we just don't know. So at the moment what we know uh, from uh, a study and from comparison with other coronaviruses, because there are other coronaviruses out there, not just this one, is that um, this virus can survive on surfaces for a few minutes, a few hours, or in certain circumstances, even up to a few days. Uh, this is not to worry you, but just to remind you that it is hypothetically mm -hmm. possible. We are not seeing a huge amount of transmission through that route, uh, spread, I should say, through that route at the moment. Uh, but again, don't be afraid. Go about your business. As long as you wash your hands and don't touch your face, you will not be transferring anything from the surfaces around you to your uh, orifices, mm -hmm. your, your mouth, your nose, mm -hmm. your eyes. Uh, this is what you don't want to do. You don't want to transfer anything from a frequently touched surface to your face. So the main messages are, if you're touching uh, surfaces, just wash your hands afterwards and keep your hands away from your face. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Maria Vera. What are the measures someone can take if he or she works in a church? A church is indeed a workplace like any other and if you're working in a church it would be the same. So you have uh, areas in your workplace which may be frequently uh, touched uh, by, by the community, mm -hmm. um, by other workers and you want to know what those are and you want to have a, maybe a system mm -hmm. in place for cleaning them um, as often as you feel they need to be clean but uh, at least mm -hmm. uh, consider what are the frequently touched surfaces and, and keep those clean. As for yourself, the protection is the same, keep your hands clean. So. Thank yeah. you very much. We had a lot of questions on different workplace settings and how to protect ourselves and prevent uh, infection from spreading. But um, there is the question, what shall we do? Sh should I stop going to workplace if someone is sick at my work with the COVID-19? I think if someone is sick with the COVID-19, they would not be at work. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know that someone has that. Um, w lots of people have the sniffles right now uh, during certain, certain parts of the world with flu season and so on. If someone has COVID-19, they will not be at your workplace because if they know that they have it, that means they've been tested and they're positive and they will be immediately isolated by the health authorities at home or in a different facility or in a hospital, depending on their level of, of uh, well-being and health. So you needn't worry about having other people in your workplace who may be infected. But again, it may be in the early stages if you have it in your community and, or if someone has traveled from a location where COVID-19 mm -hmm. is being reported, be aware that uh, people can come back to work, 
We have at WHO received our international team back from China. We have our colleagues who are going around in our workplaces mm -hmm. and it's, it's because it's not, um, it's transmissible person to person, but through close contact. So we are not concerned about people coming back from those locations, but we do have to be very mindful. And those people who may have been exposed, if it's in the community or through travel, mm -hmm. must be very aware that if they start feeling the slightest bit unwell, they need to immediately go home or report to their health services and let someone know. The important thing is to let someone know. Don't let it drag on, right? Yes, thank you very much. Um, is there any uh, specific advice for employers when one of their employees is found to, to have a COVID-19? If your employer is found, your employee yes. is found to have it. Well, uh, again, it's the same situation. In this case, what you're dealing with is if an employee has already been identified as having a case, then there's some things that you can expect to happen. The first thing that you can expect to happen is that your employee won't be at work anymore. Somebody will have already told them to stay where they are or to report to a hospital. So that employee will not be at work anymore. However, what we're trying to achieve right now with these uh, imported cases and outbreaks in different places is what we call containment. So in order to contain a new outbreak, uh, what we're doing is public health authorities around the world are doing what's called contact tracing. So if someone has been identified as, as a person with this illness, then the public health authorities will interview everyone in their surroundings. They will interview their family members. They will interview, yes, their co-workers, and they will ask about the extent and degree of contact. They will interview people they might have gone to the nightclub with the night before. They will try and trace all of the contacts of that person who is ill. So what you can expect is that you may be interviewed and you may be asked mm -hmm. questions. But the important thing as an employer is to reassure everyone in your workplace. It's not because someone has been in the workplace until yesterday mm -hmm. that you are necessarily at risk. But again, if you think you've been exposed to someone who may have this illness, then you need to be very mindful yourself of the slightest feeling mm -hmm. of being unwell or fever or dry cough. Those things as they appear, don't tough it out. Don't go to work. Call your employer. Let them know. Uh, your situation, what your concerns are, and, what, and ask them what you should do. You can call your healthcare provider and you can call your local public health authority to ask for advice. Thank you very much. Um, there is another question. How to deal with people who recovered from COVID-19 and come back to work? So at the moment, from what we know, is that people who do have this illness are recovering. Most of them are recovering. And However, they will be unwell for a period of time, maybe some of them. Some of them may be, as I said before, not very greatly affected at all. So what, what the health uh, services are usually doing in these situations is basically where it's possible to do so uh, is to test the person. If they have been confirmed to be a case of, mm -hmm. of this new illness, then they will test them until they are negative. And once they are tested and they are negative, then usually they are released either out of hospital or, or back to their communities. And many people around the world have already been released, so to speak, <laughs> from, uh, from the health services that where they were or, or allowed to return to work because they have tested negative. Thank you very much. And how about pregna pregma oh, sorry, pregnant women? Are they at higher risk and should not uh, work anymore? So pregnant women are not considered at the moment to be at higher risk than other people. As I said earlier, we are learning all the time. And uh, anyone can be at risk, hypothetically, if it's in your community. Luckily, what we have learned uh, so far is that there does not appear to be a greater risk for infants uh, who are born uh, to, to pregnant women who have had the infection, because we have seen a few nor is there a great risk for children. One of the interesting uh, things about this new illness is that children seem to be mostly spared. It's interesting that kids don't get very ill, uh, they don't get infected at the same level as, as adults. As I mentioned earlier, the risk of severe, of more serious illness increases in the older age groups. So for employers, uh, many, many of us over the age of 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, um, as, we, as we age, our risk of of having more serious illness is in fact higher. So it's in the interests of the employers to protect their workplace because they are also protecting themselves. Um, but for pregnant women, there's not a particular concern at the moment and children seem to be spared. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Rosmond, for 
all great advice you gave us today. Um, and I would like to thank everyone who was watching us today from South Korea, Portugal, Mexico, Brazil, India, Lebanon, Pakistan, Vietnam, Nepal, South Africa, the Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Cambodia, United States, Busan, Greece, Ghana, Tanzania, Angola, and many others. As Dr. Rosmond said, every day we are learning something new about this virus and we are sharing with you. So please continue following our social media channels for the latest updates, facts, and how to protect yourselves and your loved ones or in your workplace. Also, don't forget to check our website, www.who.int. Thank you very much and keep yourself safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.